The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed, it's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. The streets will never love you back. Pow. What's up, guys? Okay, we got another Sunday together here. I'm waiting for Tommy Dades. I got 23 people in the chat. Nice to see you. Boston J, I see you. Live and let live. My moderator, John Epi. Modric Molina. How are you, pal? Gerard Gerard. What's up, Gerard Gerard? So today we're going to be talking about why do big-time mafiosos cooperate? You know, you would think that, you know what, you take this saint, you give an oath to each other, but then something happens in the course of that time, you know? where it's time to do time. You know, you're involved in a couple murders. Uh, your world comes tumbling down. And now you're facing life in prison. And some of these mafiosos, they lived a, a, a great life. You know, the money's coming in, the big fancy houses, the fancy cars, you know what I mean? The beautiful woman. And uh, it's time to go to jail. I'm saying you roll the dice. For example, Joe Messina, he rolled the dice, he blew trial, but he knew in back of his head that the feds would take him. And what did he do? He wore wire on Vinnie Gorgeous and he put Vinnie Gorgeous away for the rest of his life. Think about that. What a treacherous life, right? You think these people are your friends, but uh, at the end of their life, it comes down to they're always thinking about them. They don't care about their friends or their associates or their brothers. It just don't work that way. At the end of the day, they think about themselves. Thank God I never took an oath to that life. I was a young kid. I learned a lot from these guys. When I had my back against the wall, I realize, you know what, this is not the life I want to live. But uh, John Stolberg, thanks for coming. I see you. Hi, how are you? Unique Mastiffs. When does the Bad Avenue movie come out? I hope, uh, you know, someday that would happen. Gary Montilione. Hello, Boston, Gerard, Don, Joey Doves. Live and Let Live, Joe Murray, how are you? Boston J. May 13th, Jimmy, you're the best. Thank you, I appreciate that. Captain and Coke, 70. The way they cooperate now, there is no way you can ever trust anyone. It's a dead end. Yes, it is. Absolutely. To get involved in that life today, you got to be a mental patient. What's up, Jimmy? Jojo Bean. Jennifer Ledette. Hello, Jimmy. How are you? Gary Montilion. Jimmy, how's everything, brother? Thank you, Gary. I hope you're feeling good. I hope you get some good results. And you're always in my prayers. See, the wool, you keep in touch from the old days. Julio Santino, what's up, Jimmy? Now, guys, we're just waiting for Tommy Dates to come into the studio. Once he comes in, I'll start the show. Joe Law, need a little pick-me-up after the Rangers lost. Thanks, Jimmy. I mean, is that series over? Is there still another game? 
Hi, how's it going? Please let me know if you speak to Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, I would love to speak to Shia LaBeouf. I think I ruined uh, that relationship between me and Shia. Shia, uh, Shia didn't want to part with anything. You know, he just wanted everything for free. And you know what? That's what Hollywood wants. They want everything for free. They don't want to give nothing up. Sheba man. Jimmy, happy Sunday. God bless. Uh, we got Joe Murray in the house. What's up, Joe? How are you? Hello, Roderick Molina. Bill Alexander, thanks for all of your hard work to put these videos out. You obviously put a lot of work into it. I do the best I can, I tell you. You know, I like doing it. I like telling stories. It's fun and it's entertaining for you guys. Let's see, Boston J. Hollywood is La Costa Nostra, bro. Oh, it sure is, absolutely. Mike Roch, Jimmy, love you. Hey, Jimmy, how's it going? Best wishes from London, England. Neil Manning, what's up, Neil? How are you? Like I said, I'm just waiting for Tommy Dates once he comes in the, the chat. Let me see what's going on with Tommy Dates, 7 p.m. Let me send them uh, a link. Hold on, guys. Okay. I sent Tommy Dades a link. Hopefully he gets it. I love your stream. I love when Tommy comes on, he connects the dots. Yes, he does. Tommy Dades, the encyclopedia. Is Joey Dubs in the house? Joey Dubs, you in the house? Let me see you. Where you at? James Welch, can you explain who Tommy is? Tommy is a first grade detective. Uh, Knows a lot about organized crime, arrested a lot of organized crime guys. He's actually one of the agents who arrested me. And, uh, you know, as you know, I cooperated. I became their friends with him. He's like a big brother to me. Jimmy, I was on Bad Day the other day. It looked like a third world country. Yes, it did. Gary Too Tall. That's what it is. It's a third world country now. Raphael G. Hey, Jimmy, been a fan since day one. Keep on doing what you're doing. Much love from Indiana. Indiana, I love you guys. You guys are the best. I know a few people in Indiana. Hey, Jimmy, this Lee Montoya out here in Utah. And no, I'm not the LDS. Haha. -ha. Don't know what you're saying, buddy. I don't understand. Sending my respects as always, top show. So far, we had 103 people in the chat. Tommy Dates, where are you? Jay, Ta Jay Tano Bracco. Did I say it right, Jay Tano? Because you keep on correcting me when I say your name. Okay. Jay Tano, right? Two good videos. Just watch them. I was in the sun today. No humidity. Beautiful. Yeah, so I'm going to be getting ready for the sun myself. I haven't took the sun yet. But I'm going to be getting ready for it. I love taking the sun and getting the tan. Graham, thank you for the $17.99. Tommy, I see you. All right, so Tommy Days is in the studio. I'm going to bring Tommy Days on in a minute or two. Let me let him get all set up. Looks like he got a haircut. This Tommy Days, Tommy Days, the encyclopedia. That's his name, the encyclopedia. He knows everything, this guy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I love doing things with Tommy Dades. Phil Grimaldi. There's my other buddy right there, Phil Grimaldi. I love Phil Grimaldi. Jimmy, it's Gaetano. Okay, I got you. Gaetano. Thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. And uh, Phil Grimaldi is one of the detectives from Police Off the Cuff. 
He has a podcast. So check that out. Police Off the Cuff with Bill and Phil. They're, they're friends of mine. I love those guys. Check out their podcast. Mo, Jimmy, about Beth Avenue movie, how much investment money would you think I need? You know what, Mo? Let's talk about that because that would be a great investment for you. So let's talk about that maybe tomorrow sometime. And uh, thank you for coming to the chat. You know, I love you, Mo. You know, you're a great guy and I appreciate all you do. Okay, let's bring Tommy Dades in. And uh, here's Tommy Dades. What's there. up? Hey, Tom. <laughs> My guy. There he is. How's everything? Hanging in there, Jimmy. Hanging in there. Okay. No PCAP today? Nah, it's too hot. <laughs> well, Tommy Days is here, guys. So, uh, you know, the topic of the day is, you know, why do these mafia guys cooperate, like these big guys, a guy like Joe Messina, a guy like Gas Pipe, you know? And, and I understand that, you know what? Some of them can't do the time, but some of them are also uh, – you know, used to a certain lifestyle. Oh, you asking me? Yes. I for the audience. Um, uh, there's a lot of different reasons, and I don't think, you know, not everybody really realizes the reasons. Some people don't say the real reasons, but you come to know why they do. Uh, there are certain people you're a hundred percent right that uh, won't that cooperate just for the fact that they don't want to do, you know, the jail time. Period. That's the only motive they have. Uh, I'll give several examples without mentioning names. Well, I'll give you as an example to start with. You did five and a half years, from twenty-three years old in Lewisburg, so obviously you weren't afraid to do time. Um, a lot of things happened while you were in that, uh, kind of opened your eyes up to what you had been involved in. One of the biggest things was you saw a group of guys that were very close together, that you were so close, you tattooed numbers on your ankles to make you guys a crew. And you saw two of those people with numbers on their ankles kill the number one guy who actually put that crew together and probably would have killed for them, not killed them. So that kind of turned your stomach. And why would you, why were you going to go spend the rest of your life for guys that you know would have, would have friends of yours would have, would have killed you. Another example is, uh, we had a guy that's pretty well known. Um, they killed his boss and then they, shot him twice, shelved him, took everything that he had, and he didn't have any money to support his family. They didn't give him a chance to earn. He got arrested, and they were looking to still, you know, they, they were still looking if they could to kill him. So in that position, they just killed your boss, who you were very close to. They shot you twice. They took everything you had, and they're still looking to hurt you. So basically, hey, Joe, what's up, pal? How are you, buddy? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what motivation do you have not to? Um, you know, when you, look, when you look at certain things, you know, the mob makes a lot of mistakes. You know, people are under the illusion from movies that, you know, if you're involved in organized crime and, you know, like even in Goodfellas, you know, they say uh, – you know, uh, when Henry Hill is going to go to jail before he gets locked up, you know, don't worry about it. We go to jail. We take care of each other. Tell him his wife was freaking out about who got collared. They don't take care of the people who go to jail. You go to jail, you've forgotten about it. You're on your own. Your family's on their own. Go, you know, go knock on the door of some captain, and they're going to tell you, you know, sorry, go down to the welfare center and go on welfare. And, to and Tom, you know what? It's something you said that because – I remember Joe Bonanti telling me, you know what, when you go to jail, you're on your own. It's fact. I mean, it's a fact. I, I know a lot of guys that, you know, had to consider that 
before they cooperated because they had to consider their kids and they had to consider, you know, their wives or, or their moms or dads or elderly or whatever, knowing nobody was going to be out there to look out for them. So they leave you to starve. And, you know, if they, you know, like some of these guys can afford it, if you would have took care of the family and all you had to do is concentrate on yourself doing, doing time and eventually you adapt to doing time. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you adapt to anything else, you know, you each, no, go ahead. Uh, and Joey Frakes, he says, fear of prison is definitely one. I don't understand the guys that do 12 years, get out, get pinched, and rat. I also understand the prima donnas that don't want to give up the life. Well, to answer that question, you don't understand. I mean, you know, it's a good question. You know, why guys that do 12 years get out, get pinched, and rat. Um, you don't know what happened in those 12 years while they were in. And when they get out, you know, if they got to go, they only know one way to earn, but they still have it in the back of their head. There's a lot of circumstances and things to change. So you don't know what's going through their head. If they did 12 years, it means they're not afraid of jail. So they can deal with jail. And jail is a fear, definitely a, a, a defining point on some guys that do cooperate, who've never gone to jail before, and before you put the first click of the handcuff on, and, you know, they, they tell you anything you want to know. So, I mean, it's like, for, for example, Sammy, everybody's like, oh, Sammy, cooperate. Sammy, you know, first of all, Sammy goes to prison, and the first day he goes to arraignment, he's listening to tapes, of his boss ripping him to shreds to the point that he you know gets delusions that he was probably going to come to the end of the line and get killed you know like the guy's ripping him to shreds he's his underboss he's not supposed to be talking to other people about his underboss so right there that puts the sour taste in his mouth so now it wasn't like sammy cooperated the first day it was like nine ten months in mcc him sitting there and sucking things in and then John Gotti doesn't want to give him a Frank Ocasio, you know, discovery material or any kind of tapes or things that are going to help them fight their case. So basically he sent right to them, the street needs me. I got to get out. So you, you got to take it on the chin. So spend the rest of your life in marrying, you know, marrying prison. You know what I mean? And me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fight my case. So basically He's betraying them, so why, you know, like I always use that as an example. He was playing chess with Sammy. They should have all fought the case together. He was acting very arrogant in prison. I told you he got mad that they ate an orange before him. You know, these are all true stories. Yeah. So Sammy's sitting there, and you're sitting in MCC stewing, so you heard the tapes. Now you see the attitude. So who are you being loyal to? If you would all stuck together and try to fight the case together and he didn't hear those tapes, maybe Sammy would have never cooperated. You know what I'm saying? But if, you, if, if you're giving me motive and reasons why Sammy did, people are going to all have something bad to say and say he shouldn't have, whatever. But at the end of the day, he's looking out for himself because what that life was supposed to be wasn't being portrayed to him under very serious circumstances. I have a uh, big ragu. Jimmy C was in a different position. He wasn't straightened out, but for a May guy, that's no good. So what he's saying, I wasn't, I wasn't straightened out. But Tom, I have another question. This is the question now. When Wild Bill, for example, got pinched with all his guides, what he did was he funded all the attorneys. Everybody's attorneys, yes. Let me finish. He funded everyone's attorney. And he put money in their commissary every month. Now the thing smart. is, now the thing, now the thing is, which is smart, right? You keep the group tight and you right. keep them together. You keep them strong, right? Don't keep them weak. Yeah. So what happened was when I got pinched with Anthony Sparrow, you know why? He didn't offer to pay for none of our attorneys. Anthony Sparrow was basically just worried about himself. He didn't care about none of us. Listen. Uh, the question the big rock grew has um 
being an associate on record with somebody, you know, and being a made guy, yeah, it's two different things in that world. But if you're a captain and you're, you get shot two times and you get shelled for no reason just because they kill your boss and they feel that maybe that you're a liability and they make up stories about you that aren't true to use it as a legitimate excuse to kill you, take all your money, prevent you from earning a living. So what, so what are they, what are you supposed to do? What really, what are you supposed to do? You either, there's only one thing you could do. You either got to go to war with them, but if you're by yourself, you're going to, you and your family are going to get killed or you're going to go to jail and take your chances on getting shanked in prison, which you know is going to happen. Or when you get out, they're going to kill you. So, you know, I mean, when you really think about it, I know guys that have said that they've actually went to ceremonies to get straightened out and they're being told that, you know, don't forget. I mean, it's a fucking ridiculous. It's a ridiculous, childish thing to say. We come before your mother, your father, your kids, your wife. So if your son is basically dying, but we call you on the phone, you got to leave your kid there dying because you got to come because we call. How many guys have told me as they're taking that oath in the back of their head, saints burning in their hand. Now, this is, I'm telling you a true story. Where in the back of their head, they're saying yes, they get strained out. But in the back of their head, they're saying, no fucking way am I going to take my son, you know, you over my son or you over my mother. Who are you going to take over your mother? You know what I'm saying? Your mother needs you like in a, a serious situation and you're getting a phone call because you got to go collect money from somebody. You're going to go collect money. I mean, come on, give me a break. I Mike. Mean, you got you to think, really think about it. Think about it as a human being, like survival, whatever. Yeah, if you're a group of guys and you're close and you're protecting each other and you're all taking each other's back, whatever happens, happens. And, uh, you know, you all end up going to prison, you know, everybody's making sure that everyone's family's okay. But you people don't understand the treachery and like the deceit, you know, there's no, there's no taking care of nobody. You're gone, you're yesterday's news. You're not earning, you're not, you're, you're no use to nobody. You're in, you're in jail and you're right. Billy was smart. Billy tried to keep that whole crew together, keep everybody tight, keep everybody on the same side. And honestly, they won that case. And they had a strong case against them. They all walked out of prison. Yeah, that was something. You know what I'm saying? The smartest thing Billy should have done, as soon as that case was over, he took care of all his guys. He was starting fresh. He should have grabbed his family and moved to the other side of the country and not been bothered with nothing. And he'd still be alive today. Mike Wall says, Tommy Dades never ages. Yeah. <laughs> that, thank you for the lying compliment, but thank you. Jaitano Bracco, he wouldn't even give you a chicken cutlet. Fuck face. Now he's talking about the time when Joe Benanti had the fist fight with Philly Dogs, and I had to go tell Sparrow that Joe Benanti was in the right, and uh, Anthony Sparrow was cooking chicken cutlets, cutlets with Junior Ch Chili. And back yeah, at the that club. story, I laughed my ass off. Yeah. I and, uh, walk and put it in the frying pan and took the cutlet out myself. Yeah. And uh, me and Paulie G, we walked out and said, me, you believe this fucking guy? He didn't even know if it's a chicken cutlet. But you I know mean, what? Some guys, I hear stories like, I hear some crazy stories of like, you know, a guy making an extra $200 and, you know, a, a wise guy approached him hearing about $200. This guy's, you know, he ain't really got much money. The other guy's got hundreds of thousands buried. He's like, Where's my hair? But that's serious. Where's my hair? Are you fucking kidding me? Grease. If you treat, like, you know, said it the best, Sonny in the Bronx style. You know, don't give them too much, you know, so they don't get spoiled and don't need you no more. Don't give them too little. Keep them comfortable. You know what I'm trying to say? Keep guys, you know, if a guy deserves to, you know, if you get guys that, there's a way to make guys respect you, and, you know, do the right thing by you. But the way they do things in the street for real, 
guys make each other hate each other. You, you know what I'm saying? It's tre it's treachery. It really is. It's a it's a treacherous life. It was supposed to listen. What started organized crime, like we talked about the last time, was the was was the Jews, the the, the the Italians, all different nationalities, all different kinds of organized crime of them being discriminated against when they first came to the United States. Those guys took care of their families. Those guys were family men. Yes, they were ruthless. They were a different breed of people. You know, look what Maya Lansky did to broker deals with Lucky Luciano to get him out of jail. You, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, these guys really looked out for each other in a lot of ways. But today, I mean, even at times when I was working, you know, the, the treachery, and they use an excuse to kill somebody, and it wasn't it wasn't a bona fide excuse. It could be over abroad, and that wasn't a good enough reason to kill him, but they make up another reason to kill him. You, you know what I'm saying? And like the question that was asked before, you know, he uh, you, you go to jail for 12 years. You don't know what went on in the street. You come back, you start hearing things. You don't know what went on that affected you, your family, maybe your friends, that start to turn you off on that life. You know what I'm saying? It's not all glamour. You, you, you know what I mean? It's there's, there's a lot of bad things that happen in that life. A lot of families that suffer, both the people that are in it, people that they, you know, that they kill or hurt, or it, it, there's no happy endings there. And it no. don't take a detective to tell anybody that. You know what I'm saying? Some people are in awe of watching that shit on TV. You know what I mean? But look at some of the shit that they do, even on TV. It's not a, it's not a fun place to be. You know, it's it's like some guys are really smart. Like a guy like Sammy. Sammy legitimately knew construction, excavation, you know, drywall, all that stuff. And... He could have been very wealthy without being an organized crime conducting that business. You know what I'm saying? Sammy was a self-educated guy. But like Anthony Spiro, you know, people feel bad for Anthony Spiro. I see other websites where they're like, let Tommy Karate out. Yeah, owe Tommy Karate $5 and see if you want him out of jail. You know, this guy hung people in showers and dissected them in front of other guys before he dissected them. He, it's animalistic. Like it's really, it's really sick. And you know, one day they're gonna have to meet somebody, they make whether whoever believes in whatever it is, a higher power, and they're gonna have to fucking answer for that. You know, that's that's sick serial killing bullshit. How many karate you don't want on the street? Because God knows how many people that guy killed. Yeah, in all honesty, Tommy Karate should should have got killed on the street. But uh look at this guy, JB, he said. Sparrow sealed his fate when he didn't offer the chicken cutlet. <laughs> I feel like when all these watching, he would understand what I mean. Same thing. He didn't bring the pancakes. <laughs> That's an inside joke. This this Gerard Gerard, an old time, he says, let the beheader out. He's saying it as a joke, meaning Tommy Karate. No, but, but uh, seriously, how do you go to bat on any website and say, let Tommy Karate out of jail? I mean, the guy's a serial killer. He's out of his friggin' mind. He belongs in a mental institution for, for, for 900 years. He's just a legitimate serial killer. Why would you want to let him out? Exactly. Who's he going to do anything for? You know what I mean? This uh, Jay Rhodes. Let's see. Uh, Jimmy, can you ask Tommy if there was ever any mumblings of Scarpa being an informant? Like, you ever oh. had anything... You mean before before it came out that he was? Yeah, yeah. Like, like did anybody in the street ever say that he, he's a foreman? I've heard it from I've heard it from numerous people, either on the street or within law enforcement, not saying he was, but suspecting that he was. I think I heard that for the first time in 1989. Yeah. So, so you know what? So this is a prime example. Okay, Joe Messina was a boss of the Bernardo crime family. This guy actually killed people because he thought they were cooperating. Yep. So as we, we know the story about uh, Joe Messina, where, you know what, he rolls the dice, he knows in back of his head if he loses. He's he can, yeah, he's going to come forward. You know why? Because 
you know, they're going to take him. And then what he does, he wears a wire on Vinny Gorgeous and puts Vinny Gorgeous away for life. So you know what? Let's talk about Joe Messina for a second. I mean, this guy was a, a boss. He had tons of money. When, they, when he got pinched, they had gold bars in his ceiling. In my opinion, listen, I'm never going to say I, I disagree with the government. You know, the, well, the, this, the, the government as far as, you know, the agents and the decisions the U.S. Attorney's Office makes. I'm not going to say I don't disagree with the government because I have my own disagreements with them today anyway. But uh, if you take some, if some, they make you take you to trial and go through all of that, which is a lot of work and a lot of money by the taxpayers, and you blow trial. So he was facing life in prison. I know that they wanted his information. You know what? They already had, I think, Sal Vitale. You know, so Sal knew his brother-in-law, who was the underboss, they knew a good portion of what Joe had to offer, you know? So you don't get... You know, the only good thing about Vinny Gorgeous getting arrested was that they were able to uh, stop a conspiracy against uh, a U.S. attorney that they were trying to hurt. That's the one good thing that came out of it, that I'm happy, you know, that that happened. But without without that, I would have told Joe Messina, have a good day. Too late. Enjoy yourself. Rot in prison. Tommy, name one of the uh, wise guys. That was actually good with their hands. That was actually a good fighter. That was actually a good fighter with his hands. Frankie DeChico. Frankie DeChico. Sammy the Bull. A uh, Sammy the Bull. Okay. Um, Paulie Galino. Okay. Uh, let me think. Um. There, there's a couple of guys that are still out there, so I don't want to mention their names, but uh, I've met a few that can handle themselves very well. But yeah. those, are three, those are three for sure. I, I want to I name another guy who had tons of money, okay, and uh, he was a banana captain, Richie Cantarella. He worked for the Post. Richie Cantarella worked for the Post. Him and his son were made guys. I don't believe he did any jail time whatsoever. They killed the guy that worked for the post that was a boss. He went missing. His body was buried. I was there. I was I had nothing to do with the investigation. I was a tag along for manpower. I was there. He lived uh, uh, on Nicolosi Drive. And I'm going to be honest with you why I went on the takedown was because I've never been in any of the houses on Nicolosi Drive. <laughs> and I wanted, to, I wanted to see what it looked like because the houses are gorgeous. And I went there. I was looking more at the decor than I cared about him. And uh, um, as soon as they put the handcuffs on him, when they were leaving with him, I told the agent it's going to be a long ride back to 26 Federal Plaza. You could see it in his eyes. It was over. You know, and he was a mean son of a bitch on the street and played like a real tough guy. But he folded. You could see his, it, it was like the, the sails got, you know, the, the wind got right knocked out of his sails as soon as they put handcuffs on him. And he knew he was done on that murder, amongst other things, from a guy from the New York Post. Yeah. Also, Vincent the Chin was a good fighter, right? Yes, that's another guy. And, and, and a guy you knew very well. From Avenue you, you. The Vinny old time. Gorgeous. Huh? Oh, Angelo Defenders. Angel Angelo Defenders. I Another would, would would have beat you to this day, would have beat you down. Yep. So uh Lewis Cole, Jimmy, ask Tommy, does he think if Roy DeMeo was still on the street in 1985, would Gotti and Sammy have still whacked him? Yeah. I, I'll tell you why I believe yes. I'm not saying it. Gotti, I don't know what God, Gotti would have probably been blinded by the cash. But don't forget, Sammy was forced because of, I, I won't name the names out of respect for their family, but two, two guys that Sammy was very close to 
that he had to have killed because they had a major drug problem and they had to work with him. Um, he had to get rid of them because he was afraid if they got pinched, they were primed to talk. And Roy DeMeo was killed because they knew that he had a major drug problem. And that's why he was gotten rid of. And I think Sammy would have told John, you know, he's out of control. You don't know what he's going to do if he gets collared. And if he got collared, he was facing life, four life terms. So, yeah, I think they, I think he would have got killed. Yeah. So, you know what? Let's talk about some other stories about guys cooperating. Now, obviously, a lot of guys don't just cooperate because they can't do the jail time and they're used to the lifestyle on the street. Some guys actually, uh, you know what, are like outcasts in the street. Say, for example, a guy gets straightened out. But you know what? There's a crew of guys in the same family that really don't care for him. So what they do is they start congregating against him, okay? And you know what? They start talking bad about him. And you know what? They're looking to give him a bad name, call him a rat. And then, you know what? What other choice does he have? He don't have a choice. Because you know what the end result's going to be. And you could feel the coldness and the chill in the air when that happens to you. And there's guys I know that have happened to. Look at Al Diarco. Al Diarco, he, he got, I don't, I don't know the whole story about it. I, not, I spoke to Al once over the telephone. And uh, I didn't question him anything about, you know, why he cooperated. But the, 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 the rumor is, you know, it's pretty much a fact that he got a delusion that he was getting killed and he walked right into the FBI building. You know, that's how strong of a feeling that he believed he was going to get whacked. He was looking to protect him and his family because his son was also a May guy. And, you know, that's why he ran. So, you know, if you're going to abuse somebody or stop them from earning or give them a feeling that, you know, something's going to happen to them, you give, you know, you give it, you're a human being. You still, you know, you still got to learn how to survive, you know? Yeah. How about, uh, now this is a guy out of the outfit, Frank Collada turned, he turned once they proved that Tony the ant was going to kill him and blame everything on him. I mean, listen, there's, you know, people are always spreading false rumors in that life. You know, you get guys that, uh, you know, get, get, you get guys that get jealous. If a guy's got something good going on and they know, like, they don't think that they're getting their fair share or whatever it may be. You know what the bottom line is always comes down to money. Of course. And they'll make up an excuse to get rid of them and you'll see that person with that guy's business, you know, the day, the next day, you know, like I saw, you know, when Sammy had to have somebody taken care of that I don't think he really wanted to, he had a driver, he was driving Sammy. And the guy that kills that guy, the next surveillance we do on Sammy, the guy that killed that guy is the guy that's driving Sammy. It answered your question. And, and I didn't know anything for sure then, but I said to myself, there's no doubt about it. He had something to do with it. Turned out he's the only one that pulled. He was, he was the trigger man. He pulled the trigger. So everybody's doing it for a reason. And in, that, in the street, it's all about, listen, I'm sure there were some loyal, wise guys in the street, some guys that, you know, are fair, some guys that are well-liked. You know, um, I heard good things about, you know, a lot, a lot of guys, that they were decent guys. But on the whole... They're just, they're just looking to get richer. You know, I don't know how many cars you can buy, how many diamond rings you can buy, how many restaurants you can buy, how many broads you can have. But most of the time, it's about greed. Here's, uh, speaking of informants, when we, when we going to see the paperwork on Gas Pipe? Now, the thing is, since you brought up Gas Pipe, why does a guy like Gas Pipe cooperate, Tom? This guy... Uh, I mean, he killed 36 people involved in 36 murders, right? All of a sudden, you know what? Okay, he's got his back against the wall. What is it? Well, I'm going to answer this question. I've seen, the, I've read Gas Pipe's debriefing during the mob cop investigation. I read it twice. It was over 500 pages. 
And I don't think anybody's ever going to see what Gas Pipe wrote. You know what I mean? It's uh, You're never going to get your hands on a copy of that. Um, but that thing read like a book. Let me tell you that if they published Gas Pipe's debriefing, whoever debriefed him, you know, there were numerous people that debriefed him at other times, did a fantastic job, you know, in their debriefings. And the stuff that was in that book, there were police, there were cop, there were guys' names in there that I never even heard of. As a matter of fact, you educated me on one of them, and I mentioned that guy to you, you know, um, in passing, and you happened to have met him or known about him, and not many people would know about this guy. There was some crazy stuff in his in his debriefing, some crazy stuff. But uh, my reason why Gas Pipe cooperated, he was gone forever, and he didn't want to go to jail forever. He wanted to spend the rest of his life forever in prison. So, you know, you think, that, that's the only reason he cooperated. You know what I mean? Do you, Do you think he could have got on that plea deal and got like a twenty five year deal? I think he would have got less than that, a lot less than that. Wow. So you know why? He could have stood up and, and got like that 22, right? I think even less than that. Wow, that's something. Wow. I think less than that because I remember there was a point in time when we were speaking to him that he said if I would have took the plea and never cooperated, I would have been out already. So wow. I think he, it was even less than that if he took a plea. And when he cooperated, he pled guilty to like forever. And whatever reason the government decided to rip up his cooperation agreement, that's what he pled guilty to. So that's the reason the, and your motive is to, you know, I believe 99.9% .9 or 100% of what he wrote in those, in his debriefing, there are other reasons and things that I think he did. In, in both in, in, in the unit and some other stuff that it was hard enough to get him as a witness with 37 murders under his you know, in his testimony. And then he just started doing stupid shit from what I understand. And he really would have been useless to the government. His information was invaluable and you could never make what he wrote, you could never make up. I mean, I believe everything that I read in that, in, in those trio too. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And it was all the stuff just to show you, everything he said about the mob cops were corroborated by, by Burke Kaplan. So every down to the letter was corroborated by Burke Kaplan. So I do believe everything that he wrote in there. Yeah, you, you know, as we know, there's no honor amongst thieves. Uh, Lewis Cole, Answer Jimmy, Jimmy, ask Tommy, does he Answer think, yes. yes. So yes, they, he does think that they were involved in more murders than uh, you know, they got accused for. And uh, who's another character that uh, you know what? How about uh, the first guy who cooperated from the Genovese crew? What was his name? Talking about Joe Valachi. Joe Valachi, a guy like Joe Valachi. You know what? He's the first guy that comes forward. What made this guy come forward? I mean, especially how how big the I mean, I, it's, that's 1963, so I was a year and a half old. But, you know, I've read a lot. You know, I, I like to read about old stuff because history repeats itself. And I just like the old stories from those days. Um, not just with that, with anything. You know, I like the old days. And he was a fascinated guy. I mean, the guy kills a guy in prison. Uh, he kills the reason he's – they're looking to kill – they're looking to kill him. He gets – he gets, I, I, I mean, I have the story down to a T, but they're looking to kill him in jail. So he gets, you know, a wind of that. And I think the guy that he kills, he believed was trying to kill him. And I don't think the guy really was. I think he mistook him for someone because someone gave him the script on someone that was going to actually look to shank him. And after he killed that guy, he knew what he was facing, and he also knew that they were going to kill him, and that's what made him co come in and cooperate. But he was never really given the credit, you know, um, 
uh, that he really deserved, you know, because he gave a lot of information. He talked about Appalachian. He talked about, he named the heads of the five families. He gave a lot, a lot of very serious information. Mike Wall, Jimmy, can you ask Tommy if any mobster ever gave him the creeps? I mean, listen, I know, listen, hey, I know back in the day you always had your pistol by your side. I mean, I know nobody could give you the creeps because you know what? Back back then you didn't give a fuck. You were looking at, you know what? Crack anybody, take them down. <laughs> in all honesty, I mellowed out of my old age, you know, but, but, uh, like I said, I mean, creeps, you know, no. I, I mean, I'm being totally honest, and I'm not trying to play a, a tough guy or anything because there's plenty of wise guys that could kick, probably kick the shit out of me. You know what I mean? But if you're, if you're in that line of work, an agent, a cop, detective, whatever you are, you if you feel fear, people sniff fear out in 10 seconds. You know what I mean? And I honestly didn't have any fear. I had butterflies going into a boxing ring before a fight, but once the bell rang, the, box, the butterflies are gone. But fear, it was an adrenaline rush taking doors down, but not fear, like not like, you know, I was shy. You got to be on point. You know what I'm saying? You're, you you get trained, you learn, you work with good guys, you trust them. No, not, not no creeps. Okay. Uh, Burt Kaplan talked thanks to Joe Ponzi, a great detective. No one else could have done that. Listen, Joe Ponzi, <laughs> I I get tears in my eyes even mentioning his name. I loved him to death. There's not, he was the most decent human being that I've ever met in my lifetime. There'll never be another Joe Ponzi, and I wish people only had the pleasure of, of knowing him to know what I'm talking about. Yes, you're right. No one, everybody tried to flip Bert. Joe just had a way about him. Understand this too. Joe was a master polygrapher. And Joe just was a class act. Joe can go from talking, you know, as a regular person, like a street guy. But Joe also had the ability to turn it on and be on the level of an executive because he was an executive, which not many people could do. It wasn't like he was a phony. He just knew how to speak to the people the way, you know, they needed to be spoken to. And Joe, 100%, nobody else would have ever flipped Bert. 100%, Bert fell in love with him. And Joe solely made him cooperate. And uh, he was probably one of the best witnesses the government ever had. And God rest Joe Ponzi's soul. I love him to death, and I know I'll see him again someday. Rest his soul. Uh, let's see. Okay, here's a, here's an interesting one. The FBI picks rats carefully as not to make them look bad. Listen, I've worked with some very, very good agents, both in the FBI, federal probation, the DEA. Um, if you're, if you're somebody that has information back, back when I was working with them, you know, we worked as a team. And it wasn't who worked for what agency. We were just, we worked as a team. Um, they're not gonna, anybody that cooperates, people gotta understand. We don't just say, okay, sit down and uh, let's hear what you gotta say. All right, we believe you're gonna take the stand. It's left up to the investigators and the prosecutors to corroborate every piece of information that that individual gives you. Plus you're debriefing other people that ran with that individual and you're not telling them anything, but you're also, you'll ask them, well, what about Joe Blow? And, you know, you if you catch somebody in a line, maybe, you know, they forgot, maybe whatever, and you'll let them know, you know, what we know, and you didn't mention it to us. And if he says, you know what, I didn't say this, I'm going to say it, you know, he'll, he, he'll probably get a pass. But the truth is a cooperating witness sets you free. And you're right, the last thing the FBI, the NYPD, or the DEA, or the federal government are gonna want is a cooperating witness to get up on that stand and get caught in a major lie. Because there's, the, there's all his credibility is out the window. So as a cooperating witness for the government, the truth sets you free. 
if you lie, look what happened to Gas Pipe. He, whatever he did, like he, he was dealing stupidity with guards, and I don't know what happened, but he screwed up, and he ended up doing the rest of his life. He died in prison where he would have been out. Tom, I got a question. Let me read this guy's comment first. Stephen Gates, Jimmy, me, you, That's, and Stephen and Gates is a retired detective who worked in the Seven Six Squad. Who's a great guy and. We had the same boss at different times, Chris Strom, who was on your show. What's up, Steve? Yeah, he says, uh, Tommy, Spumoni Gardens, lunch on me. We can chop it up. I got stories, too. Ask Tommy. He'll tell you. 100%. 100%, Steve. That's why, that's why I, that's why I love uh, you know, coming on there, meeting new friends and stuff like that. Now, Tommy, I don't know if you've been watching YouTube lately. I mean, have you been watching? I watch, I, when I go to YouTube, honestly, I'll watch old Ronald Reagan videos. I'll, I'll watch old boxing videos. Um, I'll watch like clips from scenes from good movies. And I'll definitely always look to see if you put something out, you know, recently. I'll look to see if Sammy put something out recently. Uh, I'll look at stuff and if I see your name or it's a story, because there's like, I don't know how many different people, I don't even know who they are that put this stuff out there about organized crime. And a lot of them are about cases either I was involved in or cases I know. And I'll watch it just to see if they get it right. Some guys, it sounds like they read it directly from Google and yeah, they're getting the story right. Some guys make a lot of mistakes, but they, they're not really gangsters themselves. They weren't in the life themselves. So coming from them is kind of boring. So, no, it doesn't interest me, but I have seen them, yes. Uh, yeah, there, there's, uh, you know, things going around about, you know what, people making up a lot of stories about me, you know. So I, I, I want to clarify this, you know what, you're on here. So what if I want to answer this question, DV, uh, DV um, asked, no, hard I, I don't know about the others, but DB was the king of porn for the Gambino crime family. He was a captain because of his earning ability without a crew. He wasn't a killer. Um, and yes, he was the king of porn in New York City, 100%. And uh, this is another guy, for example, why did he get killed? You know, um, Gotti, Gotti just thought there were rumors about him talking bad about him. And he told Sam he had to go. And he got killed in 1809 Stillwell Avenue downstairs in the basement. And a guy named Old Man Joe Peruta, who uh, was like Sammy's Luca Brasi, is the one that killed him. And uh, that's why he got killed. He wasn't a killer, though, DB. He wasn't a killer. And, Tom, we got 552 people in the chat. Pretty good. Nice. But uh, I also wanted to ask you, you know what? Now, say for, uh, let's go to my case. So Anthony Sparrow goes to trial. He has uh, Gerard Chagall, and uh, I come forward. Joey Calco comes forward. Now, when someone comes forward, isn't there, don't they have private investigators that search for information on them? Well, yeah. I mean, Jerry Chagall is a, an amazing attorney, even though Jim Walden did beat him. So, you know, my eyes, there's nobody better than, than, than Walden. But yeah, uh, Jim Walden was the best. Um, you know, uh, yes, when you cooperate, they're going to have private investigators talking to, like, Jerry Shargell would have a private investigator, or Jerry himself would be talking to, say, like, Tommy Reynolds' attorney. You know, we're going to trial, you're pleading out, but give me dirt on. Whoever, whatever the witness list is against who's going to testify against, say, Spiro at the time, they're going to want all the dirt they can get. And, of course, they're going to give it to them because it's Anthony Spiro. So anybody that was pleading out, they were definitely talked to by PIs, lawyers talking to lawyers, 100% to get dirt on you to make sure that you told the truth. Now, anything that you did really bad in your lifetime, I mean, you could tell me, better than anything. Walden is the one that is going to, he gets you on direct first. So he's going to ask you everything bad you admitted to. 
Did you do this, Jimmy? Did you do this, Jimmy? This day. He's going to go through a whole litany of all the things that you did bad in your lifetime, all the arrests that you took. He's going to ask you about, was it true? Yes, it was true. Who were you with? And then they're going to direct you and they're going to try to come out and say, well, you know, you were such a bad guy. You did A, B, C, and D. You're only doing this because you don't want to go to jail. You know, they all come out with the same story because you don't want to go to jail. But that's not always true. Yeah. Uh, the Raja Rod, Tommy, tell us about the field hit on Patchy, Pat uh, Picciato. Now, 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 this is a prime example. This is a great example. Okay. One time, gas pipe was whacking all those guys. I okay. mean, that, that you had, I mean, Jim, I know Jimmy Gallion was involved in that. Uh, George Conti was involved in that. Georgie Zappola was involved in that. I think Frankie Lasterino was involved in that. There were like 10 guys that were involved in that hit. Pete happened to be a little bit overweight. He was a big, big guy. That's really what saved his life. They shot him like 10 times and he lived. So if someone shot you 10 times, I think you're pretty much getting the message. And he had to see, you know, face it to it. And he recognized it. He was a captain. And he, you know, some of the guys that were over him, he knew where the, he knew where, the, where, where, where the attempted murder was coming from. What would you do? What are you supposed to do? Like, you're supposed to say, okay, let me try to heal from this and I'll take my chances again. You got to, you know, you got to do what you got to do for yourself. You know, unless you don't care whether you die or not. And then they also uh, shot out his sister. Yes. Right. And I think they killed, I think they killed his uncle too. I don't no no. I know they shot at his sister, um, you know, uh, which was to prevent like give him a hint like, like to testify, which was totally ridiculous on gas pipes part. And that's something that's really off, you know, that's another rule that was broken because you're not supposed to go after people's families, especially a woman, you know what I mean? So that's another place that they broke a rule. One guy asks is Tom. What do some of those plaques behind you represent? There's a lot in here, and I'm very proud of them. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of boxing stuff in here. Um, there's a lot of things that, you know, like uh, things that were framed. Like everything's got a meaning here. Uh, the, I don't know if you can see this. Whatever's behind me here. This is uh, belonging to the Honor Legion. Um, I'll raise it up a little bit. This is uh, the Honor Legion. This is, I won the American Legion Award. The one above that is I won the Black Achievement Award for my work at Park Hill Boxing Gym. There's uh, two plaques here from the FBI at State, locking up 11 associates of Colombo crime family. Here's, here you go, Jimmy. With deepest appreciation for your tireless efforts during the successful prosecution, of ultraviolet members and associates of the Nile crime family, including Anthony Spiro, former acting boss Joe Benanti, Fabrizio Di Francesi, Tommy Reynolds, and Krista Binjo Ludwigson. That was by the U.S. Attorney's Office. This was my plaque from the police academy. This is a plaque from the Gambino squad and the FBI when I retired. Here's another one from uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for locking up Joey D'Angelo, Frankie Fabiano, Vinnie Rizzuto, and Nicky Fuzio. And the one above here is from the U.S. Department of Justice. That was for my help during the Colombo Wars. And there's a bunch more. <laughs> yeah. I know you're very proud of all that stuff. And God yeah. bless you. Not because, uh, listen, hey, I know you could have went down the wrong, work, the wrong road, you know, at that oh. time. And you told me the story. You said that you know what you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna take the fire department or the police. And you know what? After you passed, you said, "Fuck it." You know what? I passed it. I'm lucky I passed it. <laughs> and stuff like that. I was taking a chance on failing another academy. <laughs> but uh, Stephen Federico, Jimmy, I just got here. Does Tommy know anything about Joe Mad Dog Sullivan? We had run-ins with him in the late 1970s. I heard his dad was an NYPD detective. Heard the name, but not, I heard the name, but not uh, very familiar with him. Not very familiar with him. I, I read him in books from old, from a little while back. He went back, I think, into the 50s, where he was actually a shooter, from what I understand. Now, Tom, 
This guy, Bulls and Bears. Tommy, did you despise the Bad Day Avenue crew? Jimmy, did you despise Tommy back in the day? Just curious. Now, let, let me just explain this. Now, when the Bad Day Avenue started coming under investigation, I was now in prison, okay? I came home November 98, and, uh, you know, they were under investigation. Of course, a couple guys came forward. They gave my name. I had a tattoo on my leg. But uh, after they all picked up, after Tommy Dades and his crew, the agents picked up my fellow guys, they found a whole bunch of numbers. That's when Andrew Reynolds reached out to me and he said, Jimmy, whatever you do, get that number off your leg. I, um, I mean, I knew the things that they've done. I knew the things that were going on. You know, we, we had a lot of information from different cases. People came in at different stages. The spies... No, that's that's a very harsh harsh word. Um, <clears throat> I don't despise, you know, I didn't despise any of the guys from that crew that we locked up. I told you, uh, you know, I even had dealings with Tommy Reynolds at the beginning and offered him an, an opportunity to cooperate, and uh, we left off very, uh, very, you know, friendly. And I respected his decision not to. I think he made a mistake by not, but. Uh, that's his personal choice, but the spies know, and I don't think some of them like me, you know, even though I try to treat all of them like a gentleman. I mean, Anthony Spiro, we used to go to his house because we were allowed to, we were ordered to check on him. There was a court order that he was on, you know, his bail was a brace, brace, uh, a home, home arrest with a bracelet on, and we would go to his house, and he had, the first time I ever saw a barbecue in a kitchen, with a massive vent that took the smoking. And he, you know, a couple of times he made us hamburgers and we sat down and had a hamburger with him. Like, I personally didn't have anything against the guy. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, no, I didn't despise any of them. I believe some of them despised us, you know, like, and still despise us. But what are you going to do? You know, jo you know, take a ticket because that, lo that line goes along the, uh, around the block. Yeah. Uh, Sonny Varelotti. Let's see. Tommy, did you have any run-ins with Stymie D'Angelo? Stymie? Um, Joey D'Angelo never knew it <clears throat> when I locked him up. But <laughs> I knew Stymie very well. And uh, Stymie hung out in Tally's bar. Um, my daughter's godfather was very close to Stymie, who was a bartender there for a while. Um, I know the guy that killed Stymie. It was a senseless murder. Um, he was just, uh, you know, on drugs and drinking. When he wasn't on drugs and drinking, he wasn't like that. Not Stymie, the guy that killed him, but he killed him for nothing. And he got killed for it. And uh, they buried his body in South Beach. And years later, it was the body was discovered, and uh, as a matter of fact, I identified the onyx ring on the guy's hand, and that's what made me believe it was him. They notified his family, checked the DNA, and uh, sure enough, that was the guy that killed Stymie. Yeah, Stymie, Stymie was a bad guy. I mean, as far as things he did, but as far as me knowing him as a kid, he was a nice guy to me. CK, damn, Jimmy, Tommy got a hamburger out of Sparrow, but you couldn't get a chicken colored. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I was bragging about the barbecue in the, in, in the kitchen. I mean, it was a legitimate <laughs> barbecue in the kitchen, you know? I never saw it that, something like that before. How about this one? Joe Komechi. Kome how many guys got killed for nothing? Paranoia, Wild Bill killed for no reason. Johnny Keys killed for no reason. I mean, Billy, the people, uh, the people that died. I don't know. I know Billy. Billy was Billy definitely killed somebody that Mike Vecchione took up the trial for. I don't with him and George Trapiano. And uh, they killed somebody. I don't know what the motive of the murder was. And that was when he was younger. The other murders that Billy would be charged with because of the position that he held during the, the, uh, the Colombo, the Persico Arena War was 
was uh, Black Sam was one who, I don't know if Billy asked them to do it or he just had guys out looking to kill anybody uh, on the other side of the fence. Black Sam was harmless at that time. He wasn't always harmless, but he was harmless when they killed him. He was an old man running a card game. The other guy that was killed uh, by his crew was um, was uh, Hank the Bank. But Hank the Bank was in the game. You know, Hank the Bank had a pistol on him when they killed him. So he was hunting people too. But as far as uh, Jimmy Keys, Jimmy were they saying that Jimmy Keys killed innocent people? Uh, I don't. I I don't know much about him. Did he? Jimmy Keys was the guy that uh, that Sammy, um, Sammy, Louis uh, Melito, and 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 uh, Stymie are the ones that they killed him. That was a commission ordered hit. That uh, Paul Castellano gave the job to Sammy because nobody could get close to him. And if you talk to Sammy about that homicide, he kind of gets emotional about it because the way Jimmy Keys went out, the way they were talking, and they were doing it because they wanted Nicky Scarfo to be the boss of Atlantic City. And Sammy's words were, um, Sammy's words were that we killed the wrong guy because this guy was really new to life and went out like a man. But Jimmy Keys was responsible for about 50 murders. So I'm sure not every one of them, you know, deserved to die. Stephen Gates wants to come on. You know Stephen Gates? Oh, yeah. You know Stephen Gates? Okay. Uh, I Stephen Gates, I'm going to drop a link in a minute, okay? When I drop the link, just grab the link, and it'll give you directions to the studio. You don't mind, do you, Tommy? No, not at all. All right, so this guy, Gaetano Brocco, says, prison saved your life. Me, personally, I do think prison saved my life because, you know what, I think I could have been with Paulie G that day, you know, and I think they might have even had an idea about me. Who knows? You saying? But, uh, yeah, let me drop a link for Stephen Gates. When's the last time you talked to him, Tom? Uh, I got a text message of him, and you remember Danny Cerentano, the sergeant of Cold Case? Yes. Uh, yeah, a week ago. Yes, of course. Yeah, I remember Danny. Uh, all right, so uh, Stephen Gates, I dropped the link. Just uh, click that link, and uh, just the studio will give you direction how to come into the studio, and uh, we'll be waiting over here for you. So uh, let's see another question. What's going on over here? Okay. What's this? Tommy, did you, did you did you have any know about about a plain clothes Vigiano from 6'2 or even Officer Lerner? The only Vigiano I know, may God rest his soul, was an emergency service cop and his brother, who was a fireman, that died on the day of 9-11, one in the North Tower, one in the South Tower. That's the only Vigiano that I knew in the police department, and they both were heroes. Joe Murray, Stephen Federico, I met Joe Sullivan through Mike Shannon. Uh, while Sullivan was in Sullivan Correctional Facility, I did not know about him shotgunning a cop. He spent about 50 years in prison until he died. That's Joe Murray. Nobody better. Joe, you're the best. Yep, Joe Murray's the best. He really was the best best uh, guest you had on the show. I mean, so well-spoken, so knowledgeable, and one rough guy. And after he came on the show, I remember you calling me the next day, and you know we spoke about a lot of things where the things he came out with reminded you of a lot of things that happened in your life. Yep, I'm, uh, me, and, me and Joe, uh, it's like when he was talking, I thought he was talking about, well, I, I, I never became a lawyer, but a lot of things that I went through, yes. Sure, I, I, of course. So, uh, Devon Grant, hey, Jimmy, ask Tommy why the PD defunded the PALS. It was a good program that brought the community and the PD together. Tommy, what do you think about late boxer um, Amel Griffin, and my friend, Julian right. Jackson. Hold on a second. I'm going to show you Go something. Ahead. Yeah. 
here is, if you ask me about Emil Griffith, here is me, Emil Griffith, Jadon Carrington, Paul Malinaji, Louis Colazzo, Gary Starks, and me, uh, September 25th, 2004. Nice. Outside 140 Park Hill Avenue, that's Park Hill Boxing Club that was part of the PAL that still exists today under Cops and Kids. And the PAL, your hunt, what you just said right now is Emil was a great guy. I would He would come to the gym all the time. I got pictures of me, Emil, and Tyson together down there. Emil was a great fighter and a great guy. Um, they defunded the PAL which was run, you know, Patty Russo was the director of the PAL, and it made a major difference in, in all the neighborhoods. It's a no-brainer, and why politicians don't, you know, encourage that to reopen. Patty Russo has a gym called Flatbush Gardens in Brooklyn. That's a major gym. The Berry Homes in Staten Island and Park Hill still exists. Those are the only three gyms left under Cops and Kids. Harlem PAL is gone. Webster PAL in the Bronx is gone. There's no PAL in Queens. And Patty right now is working on trying to open up other gyms and get them funded. These gyms cost nothing for the kids. They save lives. They put kids in the Olympics. They won Golden Gloves. It's an amazing program. And they want answers for inner city neighborhoods, what to do with kids. They encourage education and boxing is really a great sport. It's not about hate or violence. And if you see what these kids would do, there's nothing like being the corner of a of a kid in a fight, and especially the, the finals of the Golden Gloves and seeing a kid actually win it. It's like the Academy Awards of boxing. So that was a great question, and it's very sad that there aren't PALs anymore. That was a stupid move. They kept all the other programs, but they defunded the PALs for boxing. Hopefully, you know, you guys or somebody could uh, get that program back in. I got Stephen Gates in the studio. He's going to come on in a minute after I ask this question. Gregory Scarpa Sr. snitched before Valachi back in 1962. Yes, you're right. May have been in 1959. <laughs> there you go. So I got Stephen Gates. Let's, I'm going to bring in Stephen Gates now. When's the last time you've seen Stephen Gates? We've never personally met. We've spoken on the phone for long periods of time, and we were introduced to each other by Chris Strom. Chris Strom was his boss when Chris was a, a sergeant in 7-6, and then Chris got transferred to the intelligence division. It was my boss in Intel. But Steve's got a great reputation, was a very active cop, and knows a lot about wise guys in that neighborhood. I'm going to put him on now. What's up? Welcome, Welcome Stephen Gates. How are you? Good, Jimmy. How are you, man? It's an honor to uh, be amongst two two legends. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, one legend. Tommy Day's a legend. I don't know I'm a legend. <laughs> but I, but thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, there's two legends right there, you and him. I uh, appreciate it. You know, Jimmy, I, I got, first of all, Tommy, I know you're lying. You're not showing all your plaques because you probably got some perfect attendance awards, which Jimmy is like, Cops are embarrassed to to. You're uh, very right. I've got a 20 year no sick award up here. How did you know that? We don't like to admit that though, Jimmy. It's like an embarrassment when you get like a perfect attendance award. So I know we got a few up there, but uh, well, you know, you you know what it is. Tommy's so humble, so you know what he just keeps it quiet. No, he does. I know. And what happened was, you know, I, I knew of Tommy Dade my whole career, and and it's finally got to meet him verbally through through Chris Strom. And we had a very similar uh, upbringing. And a, a few times I had asked you, Jimmy, and you're busy with so many comments with, all, with, all, with, your, with your wonderful uh, YouTube channel, Grown, which I think is amazing, is that I grew up on East Third Street in Avenue T and you, Gravesend. Oh, and wow. I out in Lolly's. I kept asking you if you remember Lolly's uh, luncheonette. And, uh, you know, Lolly's used to, used to give me and Frank Ionetti, may he rest in peace, couple of wise guy kids, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, but he used to give us envelopes to bring down the block. And my old man was a cop. And much like the movie Bronx Tales, they told Tommy, my father caught me one day and he went into Lolly's. And I, I think Lolly's was on record with the Genovese family. I don't know if he was a big guy, but he was, he was a wise guy. 
but he used to uh, turn Pac-Man machines on for us. We played Pac-Man free all day just because we were delivering envelopes for him. But, you know, we wind up, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. My old man caught me, told me to stop. But, of course, I didn't because we wanted to play Pac-Man all day. But I grew up, you know, in, in Gravesend. And I knew a lot of the guys' names you have mentioned. And um, then, of course, I became a cop. You know, some of my friends were playing gangsters. One of them, if you remember, Lukey. Lukey had just passed away, I understand, from uh, from diabetes. He was... Uh, you know what? Yeah, you know what? I was just talking about Lukey. With, yeah. a friend, with a friend of mine, he just passed away. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He. I found out. You know, he, he had diabetes, and he was very stubborn. I think his brother yelled to him from the window. What? You know, he was like lightheaded. He was pale. Let me come up and help you. And Lukey said, "No, nah, no, nah, I'm fucking. I'm okay." And he he died like on the floor, passed away. He used to protect me as a kid. Those guys looked out for me. You know, you know how Gravesend was in the '80s. You know, with the fireworks parties you mentioned the other day, it was just out of control. But, you know, to make a long story longer, I ended up as a cop and I followed in my dad's footsteps. I wore both his shields, his cop and his detective shield. And I worked in the Red Hook in Carroll Gardens, which, which to, you know, even probably to this day was still very mobbed up. But at the time was run by Punchy. Punchy was like was, was, was the new guy down there. But uh, I don't like to say last names, but Benny G, as we know, who's in right now. Yeah. And you know, there's uh, you know, his uh, father in law lefty, you know, Muscuzio's sons. You know, I used to, I didn't really deal with them per se as much because I was in the projects a lot. That's where I like, that's where the action was, you know, in the Red Hook projects or the Gowanus. I used to chase, as I told Tommy, I was like a gun guy. I used to like going after the guns where the uh, you know, wise guy kids they were smart, you know, they hung out in Carroll Park, they hung out on, on Court Street and Smith Street, and whatever they did. We could never get to him anyway. In fact, uh, Stephen Boriello used to hang out on 4th and Court Street. And uh, supposedly he always had a gun on him. But you know, he would see us a mile away. And being that I was a gun guy, he used to always try and get it off him. But he'd run into the bar. We could never catch him. But another big hit that Tommy and I spoke about was a kid by the name of Roy Fiella. was uh, in the 90s, was put down on his knees on, on, in Court Street, uh, Carroll Street Park in broad daylight. And he had his head blown off. The rumor was was that he was he was moving away from Stephen Borriello and got busted, and the feds were trying to turn him in, you know, to be a CI. And then an order came down to take him out. Uh, it was broad daylight. There was a hundred people, but supposedly the person who killed Roy was a, a, a Mexican or Hispanic kid. But the uh, main witness was Roy's baby's mother. Her name was Lenora. She supposedly um, saw everything, but was not willing to talk because. It turns out the person who really killed uh, Roy Fayola was Benny G. That was the rumor. Wow. Uh, you know, so I remember talking to Tommy. Tommy, of course, knew everything. He knew about the uh, the Perry homicide. I remember Tommy talking about Tom. Was it Terry? Oh, uh, Papa. Papa. And then the kid in the, on Court yeah. Street that was the, the man in the, in, in the, the car mechanic shop, the body shop. You're talking about Eric Curcio. Eric Curcio, yeah. So it, it's funny, um, Jimmy, I knew... So, I mean, a week could go on, but your show is limited and stuff. But I grew up knowing so much about the, the mob in, in Red Hook. And how could you not? Because, you know, the gallows came from their president street. Sure. You know, it was a well. So I knew all of these guys. I never got involved with enforcement because the feds would. That's what the feds did. And I was just a cop. And even when I became a detective, you know, usually organized crime would take over the case or they would help us. And, you know, I never caught a homicide regarding a, a mob hit. But I've responded to many, a couple of bodies in trunks. Uh, you know, we talked about Tommy you know, Sparacino. You know, I knew him, had a lot of dealings with him. But growing up, too, you know, I grew up on Gravesend. And Jimmy, you know, I was a King's Highway boy uh, on yeah. the side originally. Um, you know, with, uh, I know when you had mentioned Arthur, Arthur that lived on West Third Street in Avenue West, yes. mentioned, was his last name Gia Grandi? Yes, it was. I I thought he was killed in a car accident. I didn't know because I'm friends with his brother, his younger brother. You know, yes, John. Yeah, I grew up on yes. West Side Highway. Then I moved to Marine Park. I became an East Side Highway boy, but I never knew how bloody bad the Avenue was. And I was talking to my friend Alec, who, who has a uh, a collision shop on McDonald Avenue. He's like, "Yeah, bro, Bath Avenue was out of control." I was like, "I know." So I must have known you, but it would we would have been friends because we hung out with the same people on, in Gravesend at the Triangle, the Pizza Park, and you know Joseph Avenue. I hung out with all those kids growing up. 
And you had uh, on King's High, we had the bar, the home stretch with the Grecos. Well, yeah, that, but we used to hang out on the wrong number all the time. That's right. Yeah, that was all these boys. All yeah. these boys. I mean, even I think it was who was it? Karate's place too. Just us lounge. I think yeah, I was. Right. Yeah, that's the funny story when uh, the the barmaid there asked uh, asked Tommy. You know, Tommy asked the where's all the customers, and she said it's empty because you killed all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but Jimmy, you know, there's a bar in uh, I don't know if you could. This is a sheep's at bay called the the log cabin, and uh, it, it was much like the bars growing up as a kid. You had cops on one side and gangsters on the other, but there was never a problem. It was there was never a problem. You know? they used to, there used to there used to be a bar a very long time ago. It was called the My Way Lounge. Right, right. That Avenue, was Avenue U, yes. And Van Sicklin Street or Lake Street, I think. Yeah. A little uh, maybe West First or something. Yeah, Blue Warning. I know the place. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right across the street from the post office. The yeah, because I used to get my hair cut right next door. I used to go to Joseph Avenue. There was a guy, Frankie, there. And he used to cut my hair as a kid. And supposedly Frankie was, uh, I think he was, he might have been associated. But, you know, he was uh, such a sweetheart. He now lives in New Jersey. In fact, I went to Joseph Avenue today with my wife and had the delicious octopus salad. It's the best. Better than oh, for you. Oh, forget it. The octopus salad is the best over there. Jimmy, they oh. say there's a place on Union Street called Fernando's. The guy that owns that place, you probably heard of it. People compete. I'm, I've had Fernando's. I lived there for 15 years. Joseph Avenue is the best Pinnell oh, special. Pinnell yeah. special. Hey, but hey, what, was the place, uh, what was the place downtown that would give the Pinnell special? That's Union Street, uh, Tommy. That's yeah. Fernando's. He was, a cop, a lot. he was a cop in Sicily, as a matter of fact. And he's one of the only places that has Manhattan special on tap, by the way. On tap, yeah, on tap. He's literally only about may so maybe we should go to Joe's, my treat, you know. Become that I, better. I, I yeah. love that special. <laughs> oh, it's the best. He has it on tap, yeah. I, you know, I drink that whenever I could. But Jimmy, yeah, man, it's funny. You know, you talk about every time you bring up names of you know, uh, and I had ex uh, to, uh, Tommy Dades, was I grew up with Joey Poser and Vinnie Poser. Oh, and, wow, yeah, Vinnie Poser. I wasn't listen, J Jimmy, I was, I was a, I wasn't a tough kid growing up. But I had my share of fights. You know what I mean? I hung out with some rough and tough kids. But I was protected more than anything. I had a lazy eye. I was telling Tom I used to get made fun of. I used to wear a patch. And Vinnie Poser used to protect me in junior high school. And so, like. I'll tell you something. Because I went down Avenue U the other day. And I saw Vinnie Poser walking down Avenue U. And, uh, you know, he looks a little healthy. He was always a tough kid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he used to work out with Louis Neglia down yeah. on Avenue U on yeah. the east side. But uh, he was always a good kid, Vinny Pulsa. Yeah, man. He he. There was there was a kid. True story, right? There's um. We're, so we're like in woodshop class, and we actually had. I think I told Tommy Days a story. We had wooden chisels, real sharp wooden chisels, and we were making like you know fucking uh, statues or something. And this this black kid kept making fun of my pat my eye. Look at this retard. So Vinny loved me just for whatever reason. Gets up, puts the chisel to the kid's neck. He says, "You say one more thing." I'm going to put it through your fucking neck. 20 years later, 10 years later, I'm a cop. I'm in traffic court for the lousy two tickets I ever wrote in my life. And there's Vinny Poser sitting down on a bench. And I go over to him. But from a distance, I didn't want to, you know, say hello to him because I'm in uniform and blow him up. I don't know who he's with. But he sees me, he gets up, he hugs me, kisses me. He says, Steve, I said, Vinny, how you doing? What's going on? He goes, this guy here got me for speed. And I said, I'll go talk to him. So I went over to him. I said, listen, that's my cousin. Anything you could do. And I told Tommy, to this day, I don't know. Because I know I know Vinny went, uh, Vinny might have went to college for a little bit. But I don't know if he threw the case for him. But I was kind of hoping he did because I owed him. You know what I mean? I never forgot that. I never forgot what those guys did for me as a kid. But yeah, I I, uh, yeah uh, Vinny did go away for a little while. Yeah. But, you know, I know a couple of stories in the neighborhood. I think he's got a case pending. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think he's, in, he's going back. Uh, you know, up there, you know, whatever his story is. Yeah. But, uh, I'll tell you, but in all honesty, he was probably one of the better guys in that neighborhood. I love Vinny. I love Vinny. Back, do you know, did you know a, a kid named Dave DiBartolomeo, Jimmy? Uh, Dave, he was he was a West Side Highway kid. He was good friends with Vinny Poza, John G. Grandy, and a couple other guys. I don't like to say names. He wasn't, he worked for Verizon, then he started his own business. He, he um he's, he got locked up a few times. Um, One of my best friends in the world. 
unfortunately he had passed away about a year in September, uh, June, he passed away at a uh, heart attack at 49 years old, right before his 50th birthday. And he used to keep in touch with Vinny for me because I used to always say, please tell Vinny Pozo. I said, and he would talk to him. Vinny said, tell Steve, I, you know, I love him. How's he doing? Because I was tight with Vinny and I'm glad that he didn't forget me because, you know, he, again, he, you know, he looked there for me, looked at, looked out, looked out for me. I was a skinny, scrawny little kid when I was young. And all these guys, uh, they just like me. I don't know what it is. It just, you know, I don't know. They just took to me and uh, always looked there for me. And I never forget that neighborhood growing up and those guys that did it. I don't give a fuck if they've been in prison. I'll, I'll take them out to lunch tomorrow. I you know, it is real, real good guys, real men, guys who grew up in our time. You know, not everybody did the right thing, you know. And so, some guys, you know, I don't know what you want to consider the right thing. Everybody had their own lifestyle, put it that way. Yeah, I agree, Tommy. We grew up together, and I could, please, it's, you know, when I think of all the guys and all my friends, you know, there were guys that did things that I didn't do, and I went away where guys didn't do things the way I did things. But like you said, we'd see each other, we'd hug and kiss each other, go eat for lunch, grab a slice of pizza, still speak to a lot of guys to this day. You know, we didn't ever discuss each other's business or no. whatever. It was just how's the family telling stories with kids with, you know, my mother, with their mother, whatever, because none of us had a father. We all came from broken homes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we went through a lot of stuff together, and that's the way real guys act, you know what I'm saying? You know, you stay loyal to your friends, and, and that's the way you stay, you know? And I see that in you, Jimmy. You know, I know you've been through you've been through hell and back, man. I mean, I, I Tommy, to tell you, you know, we spent most of our careers in prison, but only for a few hours. You know, we he said I'm, I'm no tough guy, but I'm no wimp either. But man, I couldn't do 24 hours in prison, man. You were Lewisburg and Rikers, and and you did your. I, in fact, Tommy, I was telling uh, Jimmy, uh, Joe Waverly's nephew, uh, Mike, is a very good friend of mine. Friend of mine, he did. He got sentenced to eight years in Danamora, and uh, he wouldn't let me come visit him. And uh, he got downsized to uh, Woodburn, and I went up there to see him because he goes, "Come see me now, and I, you don't have to drive that far." I went up and we sat. For, I surprised him. He didn't know I was coming. And I brought, I went to bring a food, but it, his, his wife was bringing in, you know, a certain amount of pounds a month. And he says, my wife's got it covered. So I asked his wife, you know, can I come up this week? And she said, yeah, don't tell him he'd love to see you. And, and you know, he, he hugged me and there was a lot of gangsters in there. And he says, you know, Steve, he talks about a lot of guys forget where they came from. And, and he made me feel good because like you said, Tommy, you know, it, it's sometimes, you know, it's a game, you know, you got to play the game. You can't take this shit personal. And, and again, to go back to you, Jimmy, like, you know, I don't, I, what my friend Mike, what he went through, he did, he wound up doing 52 months. And I, I can't, I couldn't imagine what you went through, even though, you know, you, sometimes you had guys waiting for you, you had people looking after you, but still to go to prison and give up your, uh, you know, your freedom and, and not be at home, you know, regardless of what you did, I can give a fuck what you did. It, it's not important. You know, you changed your life around. I think that's great. But I, I commend you for for surviving your 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 time that you did in prison. I really do. Yeah, my hat, you, know, you man. I'll tell you, you know what. Thank you so much for the kind words. I really appreciate it. But <clears throat> I'll tell you, you know what. You know, thank God I come from a really good family. Tommy knows my family. I got two beautiful kids. I got guys like Tommy around me, Joe Murray, Phil, uh, Grimaldi, Bill, and uh, listen. That I mean. You know, I got these good people around me, and you know what? They put me in the right direction, and uh, I'm so blessed to have them in my life. I really am. That's true. It is a blessing when you, uh, especially when you've been through shit, you've been through hell, you know, to come out of it. You said you found God, you know, like, you know, I'm the same way too. You know, it, it, sometimes it takes uh, it takes a while. You, you, know, we, you know how it is, man. We don't grow up, guys, right? We don't grow up till we're like 30, you know what I mean? So <laughs> sometimes we don't. Oh. And, and, you know, and, and you know what? That's the thing, too. You know what? I didn't realize who I was until I got on this indictment uh, with Barrow and my friends. You know what? And then I'm reading paperwork. My friends killed my own friend. I got my back against the wall. I just finished doing five and a half years in prison. And now I'm back in jail. Uh, you know, my, my life is taken away from me. And uh, listen, I don't want to live that life no more. You know I'm saying? Because I really wasn't uh, a, a terrible person. You know, I was this young kid uh, looking up to the wrong people, a product of my environment. You know, listen, I stand on everything I did in my life, but I feel like the best thing that I could have done was, you know, I'll come forward, let it out, speak the truth, and you know what, put it behind me. And like Jim Walden said, he said, Jimmy, you know what, at least, you know what, you're going to have a light at the end of the tunnel. 
Yeah. You know, it was funny. I was watching Donnie Brasco last night. I thought about you. The line where uh, he's, he tells Donnie, uh, well, Joe Pistone, he says, the guys that call you and then kill you is your best friend. And I thought about you because I think you quoted that. And uh, I never knew that about the mob. I didn't know. And as much as I know about the mafia and, you know, and, and growing up and, you know, I didn't know it was like that. I mean, the treachery, like Sammy the Bill talks about it. You know, it's just it's unbelievable. Like you said, it's the old school mentality that's not that went away in the 90s and 80s. You know, yeah. Like what happened to, to, you know, Paulie G. I was baffled when I read, you know, because I watched you and followed you. And I was like, wow. In his fucking kitchen, like you wouldn't have heard of that in the old days, you know. But get yeah, Tommy, I know you were about to say something. I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's uh, it, it crazy because I uh was in Greenwood Cemetery, and uh, I mean that's a big cemetery, and yeah. I just was walking, and I just turned around, and I looked, and there's Paulie G's picture staring at me. Wow. I took yeah. a picture of it, and I sent it to Jimmy. And I actually went to pay my respects. He's in a you know in a wall. And uh, you look at him, I think it was 93 that he was still Jimmy, am I right? 93, July 26. And you look at him, he's like a young kid, you know? And uh, I just I just looked at him, I told him, he goes, I said, you know, it was, it, was, it was me and my friends that, you know, come from a very different world than you that, that punished the guys that killed you. you. You know what I mean? I just said a prayer for him, because it's just, you look at a kid, he's, he's you know, it's, he looks like a baby. Yeah, and he's he was a young he, he's a young guy. He doesn't realize what he's getting himself into. No, no. So if, you don't have, if you don't have the right guidance and you don't have the right people, the right influence, and it doesn't always work. Sometimes you could, and you still go astray. Life, life is rough as a kid. You know what I'm saying? No matter where you come from, the decisions you make come with consequences, and sometimes the consequences are severe. You know, but, uh, you know, thank God, like I tell Jimmy, you know, don't fall backwards, fall forward, you know, and don't look in the past, look in the future. Everybody makes mistakes. You know, everybody. There's and a good. God bless that he had a second chance at life. Yeah, you you know what? You have to, there's a Dr. Jordan Peterson, you know, if you follow him on Facebook. Oh, he's fantastic, that guy. Fantastic. He says a great guy. He's a beast. Uh, he's the best. He says, "Don't compare yourself to who you uh, to who you are. No, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to someone who else is today." And he's did right. You ever, did you ever watch any of the David Goggins YouTube uh, video? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. David Goggins is the only guy to have ever gone through all three of the special ops training. Really, he's millions of oh, the, listen to me. The guy's a beast. Well, and I know. He does. He's got millions of followers, millions of followers. Yeah. And if you look at some of his videos, he, he did all kinds of missions. He was with Marcus Luttrell and Marcus's brother from Lone Survivor, the right. American Sniper. This yeah. guy's the real deal, the real deal. And you know what he says? He's got videos with his middle finger up. And he's like, fuck what people think of you. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's... He, just don't like that guy Peterson you mentioned, another guy who talks yeah. about having to have not not wanting to always be that way, but having the ability to survive in life to having the beast mentality. Right. And, and not so yeah. much sense. So much sense when he talks. It does. Yeah, he's a genius. He's amazing. This is a Captain Colt Kuma. Imagine being a big shot in the mob and ordering the hit of a young kid. What a scumbag. All the work that he gets two best friends do it. You know, it's like he puts in all that work. I and mean, this is a detective speaking. This is the irony, which I love about this. It's like, you know, I mean, like I easily could have went that way. Jimmy, as a kid, it was very, very easily. That, you know, my old man, we got out of the neighborhood because the property value was so high. And he took a, his money and ran. I'm not to say that it was because of him that got me out of that life, but, and like you said, Tommy, my dad was a cop. He was strict, but I still fucking did what I did, knowing what it was. Yeah, you, could still, you could still stray no matter what. It doesn't mean you can walk the straight line. So I, I like, I know these guys growing up, and I mean, like that whole Paulie G story, that, that is just, that devastated me, man. All the work that he did. Think about that, and think about this. When you talk about that life, anybody that wants to defend it, Paulie G, whatever he did, whatever it is, I mean, I've spoken to Jimmy privately about what kind of kid he was. I'm not justifying anything he did, and right. I feel bad for the victims. Of that was 
could roll to. But Jimmy brought out a point. He would, he would, he would, he would not kill his friend. He would kill for his friend. Right, right. Which, which in that life, there's some kind of legitimate whatever. But I mean, it's part of what they did to him and yeah. when they did it. But his mother, now picture, his mother and father found him in the kitchen for the christening and found him face down in the kitchen. Like that's so much for Colton Nostra, right? You know, it's like he I did mean, work, uh, get made, and he was on the right track. He was on, he was doing what he was supposed to do. And then the treachery set in, like you said, and you know. And his mother and father like to see that. That's, like, their life is over. From there, you know, they might as well have killed them too. Yeah, 100%, man. I mean, we have kids, we understand. Can you make off a bid? But you know what I mean? That whole thing, that whole track, the word treachery rings so loud with that whole thing. On so many people's lives, you know what I mean. It really yeah. And you know what? When I when I think about Paulie G, you know, when he was murdered, I just uh, like I wish his father Gino would have went into Anthony Sparrow's club with a shotgun and just started fucking blasting Sparrow right in the head. I mean, that's how I think. You know what I'm saying because right. God forbid anyone hurts anybody I love, I'm going out like a motherfucker. Seriously, yeah, I believe that. You <laughs> and that's the way it's supposed to be, though. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. You have the right to defend your family. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, like, you, you, you got children, like, you know, I'll jump in front of a train and die if I have to for them. Yeah. So you better, you better come and fucking kill me. You know, literally kill me. I don't care if there's 200 of you. You better kill me to get right. to my kids. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it wouldn't be worth me living no more. I wouldn't be able to live no more. Nah, who would? Who would? Absolutely not, man. Absolutely not. You know, it's the reason why we go on. I think same thing with Jimmy, you know, it's like his savior was, you know, changing his life and then having your children. Because we know, you know, having children is 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 the ultimate life changer. I, and, I remember how overprotective of my mother I was, you know, to the point that she would get mad at me, you know. Um, like, forget about it. You know, somebody ever disrespected my mother verbally in front, like, she wouldn't tell me anything because I have no, and I was a cop even before. Right. And as I was a cop, you know, I lose my job. She <laughs> wouldn't do nothing to me. But if you, my mom, you got one mom in this world. You know what I mean? And, and you know what? When I look, when I look back at that time, I mean, even Paulie G. Listen, you know what? I'm a grown man now. I'm not a kid. I think a lot different than I did back then. You know, I'm more grown, and uh, I think of things different. I'm, you know, Paulie G. Listen, Paulie G. Did kill some people. And, uh, you know, he was a product of his environment, too. And I'll tell you, he was a great athlete. Out of all my friends, I'll tell you, he was a class act. He really was. He had class to him. Not like the garbage cans that I were calling my friends. Because they really were garbage cans, every one of them. He probably would have turned out had somebody grabbed him before he started doing all those bad shit. He had heart. So he could have used that in a, in a very positive way instead of a negative way. And he probably would have been a success story from that neighborhood had he just dismissed all those people, you know, and not looked up to a Spiro or a Tommy Karate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because he had the right, the right heart inside him. You can't teach that. You got to be born with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tom, I got a question over here. Lambden reviews. Hey, Tommy and Steve, did the Chico and Sammy took out did Chico and Sammy took out Gotti like they planned to do? If Gotti didn't act right, do you think the Gambino family would have been better off? 100%. It would have changed the face of organized crime. And there's no doubt in my mind Frankie the Chico would have killed Gotti. I would bet anything on it. And it would have changed that whole story of what happened. Think about the history of the mob. Like that was a big, you know, Take down a Sammy, John, Frank Lacasio. That would have never happened like that had Frankie the Chico been the boss. It's amazing the dynamics, you know. I mean, I saw Sammy. Sammy walked around in his sweatshirts, dungarees, sneakers. You know, he kept a low profile. He humble. wasn't out in regimes all the time. Like, Sammy went home. Sammy did. He went home. He went home to his wife and kids. You know what I mean? Whatever he did during the day. 
They, you know, Frankie the Chico was another guy that was a low key guy. You see him like wearing a members only jacket, a sweatshirt, and dungarees or whatever. He wasn't walking around in two thousand, three thousand dollars suits and his hair done every day. Like, they I mean, Tommy, I got Tommy. If you agree, like watching Sammy's podcast, that guy had more honor than 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 any other gangster. I I think you know he really truly believed in the code. And bro, I think he broke his heart. He was a true Costa Nostra guy. And I he think he, was hard because yeah, he, he realized it was all bullshit. I know. I know. I think he had, it, it, he was like no women and children, no cops. You know I mean? He just had so much honor. Like, you know, you don't, you don't, I don't know. You see Sonny Francis or Michael Francis now, I know Johnny A. Liar. They, you know, it's like, I don't believe anything John A. Light says from a lot of, I, I don't, I don't even watch him anymore. I just watch Sammy and Jimmy and, uh, you know, <laughs> I, you know what, Sammy, Sammy, you know, people, People, I think, now are coming around to understand more of why he made the decision to cooperate. And when you really think about it, Sammy opened up the floodgates for people to say, you know what, Sammy did it, I could do it. But Sammy was, a, you know, he was an amazing witness. And I know the agents that spent all that time with him in Quantico. And uh, Sammy's a... Uh, you know, he's a character. He was a character on the street. He's a character now. Yeah, no. <laughs> he, he's got, listen, he's really the last guy out there that has those type of stories from, you know, you know, because he's older than us, he's 77 years old. So he, he held a very prestigious position in that life. Yeah. But he'll say, it, you'll hear it come out of his own mouth, you know, like. It ain't, it ain't the place to be. There's only two things going to happen to you in that life. It's jail Jimmy, or, or death. You know but, what I mean? But am I wrong by and Tommy by saying he had honor? It seems like he did. Like he had the most honor. Sammy believed, you know what? He, first of all, he was a veteran of the military. You right. Know what I mean? The army, right. So he, when I speak to him, we talk a lot about, you know, politics. I don't talk gangster stuff with Sammy no more. You know, it's all politics. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy that the ex-underboss of the Gambino crime family thinks exactly the way me, some retired FBI agents and DA agents and detectives that we speak to and Jimmy, you know, we all think the same way about the world and what's going on, you know? Yeah. Um, he's not a racist guy. Uh, he's, he thought, he believed in something that he realized was all bullshit, just like yeah. Jimmy. Jimmy. It's all bullshit, so what do you want me to do? You want me to go rot in a cell for 25, 30, 40, 50 years for people yeah. that are just going to forget about me and I'm done. So right. what do you gonna say? I was a stand-up guy. I did 50 years. You're a fucking moron. Yeah. I mean, John Gotti turned on me. It's like you, get one, you get one chance. There's no do-overs in this life. You no. know what I'm saying? So whatever, Jimmy came back and Jimmy did good. By Jimmy cooperating, Jimmy saved lives. Sammy mm -hmm. cooperated. Sammy did good. Sammy saved a lot of lives by the people that he cooperated against. So both of them, Sammy ain't bothering nobody. Jimmy, Jimmy's an amazing father. He's an amazing friend. He's sincere in everything he says. And, you know, people, you know, there's, I, I see shit on YouTube where people say some negative stuff about him. And me too. I, I don't understand, like, uh, what the hate what, is. Well, if somebody's going to think about you that much to keep talking about you, you're a pretty important guy, I guess. You know, yeah, what I'm yeah. it's good publicity or bad publicity. Yeah. But the thing is, like, what is Jimmy saying to bother anyone? Like, what is he doing to, for people to say the things he says that such that I please don't even want to start that is such bullshit? Yeah. And what what's with the hate? Why do you got? Why do these people have such hate in their hearts? To like just try to destroy a human being who's trying to change his life around. Jealousy. But they'll stick up for. They'll be the same people that'll say, "Let Tommy Karate out of prison." It right. doesn't right. fucking make sense. Yeah. It's stupid. It's ignorance, and they don't have no brains. They really don't. I'm being. I'm. So, I'm not bad mouthing nobody, but somebody's got to fucking stand up. You right. know what? I tell Jimmy, be quiet. Don't say nothing because right. he, he does. He does. He does. And you know what? That's listen. Every so often, you know what? I can't be quiet. It's like, you know, Steve, you keep on poking the bear. Eventually, the bear's going to bite. It's hard. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it's hard not to, you know, it's so easy. And I, was, and I have a podcast myself 
Um, you know, I we talk about uh, depression, anxiety, guys with PTSD, and a lot. Shout of out! Sh we, shout it out! We, it's called the Serenity Lounge. Um, it's closed now, but anybody could still ask to come in. And of course, you know, we just talk about everyday life, stress, about PTSD, guys who've been in, in uh, 9/11, guys who've been in in, in, in war, and it's. Uh, you know, I got about 300 members. I, I go live here and there, and, and I, the responses that I was getting was quite amazing from good friends of mine that were, uh, you know, because there's such a stigma with medication, with mental health, and everybody's afraid that, uh, especially if they're law enforcement, they're going to have their guns taken away. And it's simply not true. Unless you say you're going to kill yourself and kill somebody, then they're going to take your guns, and rightfully so. But the stigma with mental health, and I, I have PTSD from 2006, and I'm fine. I went to the doctors. They're like, listen, you're good. You just got to keep living your life. Stay, stay How out. did you be a cop for all those years? You know, right. You don't realize is like, you know, uh, I watch a lot of these YouTube videos on police tributes to cops and stuff like that. Okay. How could you be in law enforcement, you know, for 24 years or whatever it is? And like, you, you know, even a like guy's in a radio car. Picture being in a radio car in the 75 back in the 80s. Oh, they're killing you. You're answering God knows how many jobs, right? There's 20 jobs. 60 jobs. One job you go into, you're a psychiatrist. The next job you go into, you're a marriage counselor. The next job you go into, you're a social worker. The next job you go into, you're defending, you, know, you run into a robbery, a man with a gun, a DOA for natural causes, a homicide, a stabbing. Your fucking mind. Goes minutes. from one emotion to another every 15 minutes. You don't right. think that's going to take an effect on you some sure. way, somehow? People don't realize what cops go through, and that's uh, what's kind of sad. You yeah. know what it is? They only see us at a very – most of the time when you're going to deal with a cop, you're not dealing with a cop in a good, situ happy situation, whether you're the complainant or you're right. the perp. Right. We usually are the person that – you know, bringing you bad news. The worst thing you could be as a detective is knocking on the door to tell a family member that a loved one of theirs just got killed. It's yeah. the worst thing. The worst thing you could possibly do. I hated doing it. Hated I, doing it. My, I my that's when I get scared. My heart would yeah. pump like I anything. Know. So of course you're going to be affected by it. And the guys in the military, you know, do four years. You get deployed twice. How are you going to go out and be a trained killer? And then come back to society after everything, you know, sometimes picking up your best friend's body parts and put them in fucking body bags. And now you just want to come back and you think you're going to go work in fucking Con Edison and be Joe yeah. Normal. You, you know what I'm saying? It don't work that way. The brain's not wired that way. No, it's not. It, and matter of fact, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he did 20 years on the police department. He was deployed in 2003 into crit, 18 years old. And he, he killed uh, a couple hundred people. And he came, he, re he retired from the Marine Corps, became a cop. And as a cop was an anti-crime, killed a guy on Smith Street, um, saved a woman's life. He, it was a guy who had a, a knife to a woman's neck. And he shot him in the neck uh, and, and killed him. And I, I was a union delegate at the time, so I, in, in the squad. And I had the shootings, but, you know, I internal affairs took over, of course. But I went to the hospital, and he was calm as fucking cu a cucumber. I said, Louie. You're all right. You're the one that just she goes in. Yeah. And then I find out, well, he was in the Marine Corps. He was no stranger to gunfire. Well, about five or six years later, we, him and I would go to uh, Dunkin' Donuts every Saturday and walk around Home Depot and just bullshit. And he said to me, you know, you've been kind of quiet. Lately. I said, ah, you know, it don't feel right. And he introduces me to this doctor who's a retired sergeant and uh, he's a psychologist and he teaches uh, psychology. And I just started talking to him and, you know, he, he got me through some times. And, um, you know, I was along with my friend who was in who's a, who was a Marine. And, you know, you talk about I didn't kill anybody. I was never in a shootout. And, and I have it, you know, and it's like uh, it doesn't matter how you got it. Is that when you're there, it's it's dark. It could be very dark and daunting. You know, it could, it could be life. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it has its they Dr. Jordan Peterson says that we're built to contend with the world. But like hey, being a warrior, there's a price to pay for being a warrior. And, uh, you know, I think the three of us can agree that for whatever, however we've gotten to where we've gotten, we've seen and done a lot of shit, but we have to keep moving forward and stay strong. Oh, the, the, three of us, the three of us have seen things or been in situations uh, and experienced stuff, whether it's the good side or the bad side, it don't matter. No, it that most people in their lifetime, the majority of the population, only see on television. You know what I mean? Even for things Jimmy's seen and what Jimmy's gone through, 
If you don't think it takes a toll on you, it oh, takes it a toll on you, you know, yeah. especially yeah. when you try to just live a peaceful life, yeah. you know, and then you got, you know, people, you know, fucking, you know, hating you. First of all, I don't trust anybody that everybody likes anyway. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Even people hated Jesus Christ. So yeah. Yeah, you know, right. I don't trust everybody that the whole world likes. You got to have haters or you're not normal. And yeah, right. you know what? Honestly, like I said, David Goggins, there's people that criticized him, whatever. Only guy to ever go through three, you know, um, uh, special forces. Yeah. You know, he was he was in the Green Berets, he was in Navy SEALs, and then the Air Force as something else. He went through all three of them. And this guy's just a beast, and he don't give a fuck what anybody says about him, thinks yeah. about him. He just does his thing, and, you know, he, he's always done the right thing. You don't think that guy's got... A little bit of PTSD, you know. Um, what I'm saying everything he's been through. Of course he does, and this is in like like what Jimmy, you know, about the MRE guy and all the haters. It's like you know we live our lives. I think most of us predicated on how we think people think of us, and it's easier said than done to turn around and say, you know, I don't care. You know, that might last about three months, but it, then it comes back. I know Jimmy goes through. It, you know, like he says, "Fuck these people," and you know, you can. <laughs> You can deal with it, but then sometimes it just gets, you know, it catches up with you. Like, oh, you get pissed off. You know I tell Jimmy, I tell Jimmy, I tell Jimmy, unless somebody's knocking on your door, right, to do you harm, right, like, to let people get, you know, to let people aggravate you, which it would, you know, we're all human. It's going to aggravate me. I'm, I, you know, sometimes as a cop, you kind of get used to it. You know, you come you become numb to it. I'm numb but to it. I don't. I honestly. Like if someone, I, you know, you could say whatever the freak you want about me. If you're you're not affecting my life, so right. Right. do whatever you want, say whatever you want, call me whatever the fuck you want. You ain't put money in my pocket. Right. You ain't you ain't my friend. We're not going to dinner. I could give a shit if I never see you. Don't see you. Say what the fuck you that's, want. That's that's you, you got to adopt, Tommy. You know, and I you got, I've, you, got to, you got to learn to get thick thick skin. You know, like there's a there's a you know uh, they try to. Like Denzel Washington, I watched some of his. Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, two amazing guys. And they tried to get Denzel into getting into the race car, you know. And they'll ask all these kind of questions, whatever. And does he believe in Black Lives Matter and all of that? And he'll turn around and say, "Listen, the government and nobody can tell, you know, order me to like you." He goes, right. "I'm black. I believe you're white." He goes, so we're engaging in conversation. He goes, maybe we'll hit it off and maybe we won't. It's up to the two individuals. And if I don't like you, I'm not going to bother with you. Tyrese Gibson has YouTube motivational videos. And he'll say to you, you don't, you know, stay away from toxic people. Yeah. So because somebody calls you, don't mean you got to return the call. Because somebody emails you or texts you, don't mean you got to read a return the email or the text. You, you know what I'm trying to say? There's plenty of haters out there. A guy like him will say, so many people are hating on me because I got this or because I got that. And I just pick and choose the people that I stay with who are positive attitudes. You stay around positive energy, you become positive. You stay around negative energy, then you become negative. People who talk and hate, they hate themselves. And they're looking, when you look to badmouth people constantly over and over again, look, I don't badmouth people that I've locked up or people who've done bad things. When you judge somebody, you don't define, you, you don't define them, you define yourself. Right, so, I agree. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, if you got that much hate in your heart, then, then go join then go join the military and go take it out on the people who deserve to have it taken out on. You know what I'm saying? Go at least make use of the fucking hate that you have in you. Go hide behind a computer. And bad mouth tough people, guys. you know what I'm saying? Play people that's what I used to call telephone tough guys. And those are the yeah, first yeah. people that are going to call 911 when you fucking smack them in the mouth to shut up. So come on. You know, it's funny. You talk about telephone tough guy. Uh, I had a case, uh, Jimmy. I had a case against Benny G from Red Hook. He, uh, oh, I, know, I, know, I know who he is. No, I know, I know you know what I'm talking about. He allegedly, let's say, smashed a jewelry store up and hit, a, hit, hit this guy over the head with a helmet. And my partner, Sal, had the case. I said, Sal, Benny's not coming in. You know, that phone's going to ring, and he's going to tell you to go fuck yourself. And the phone rings. You know, 7-6 squad, Detective Bates. Yeah, Steve, it's fucking Benny. Yeah. 
fuck you, come get me. And he hung up. So I said to Sal, he, go, he goes, he's a telephone tough guy. I go, nah, he's actually a tough guy. <laughs> I go, but he ain't coming in like I told you. That case is going to go nowhere. But, you know, uh, you know, keyboard warriors and like, you know, Jimmy, I know you talk about it, you know, and, you, and, you, and I think you do it handling it quite well. And like what, what Tommy just said, you got to keep keep over in your head is just, you know, fuck them. You know, I think it's just pure jealousy. What else do you have to do? Right, Tommy, if you have that much time on your hands to spread I the hate, you a get a fucking job, then take a bit. Pick, pick, pick a new fucking subject. It's just Go. like I say, you get some of these wise guys or, or, or guys from the street. They're constantly to get out, they're right back in jail. They get out, they're right back in jail. You would think they would hit them in the head and say, you know what, I think I picked the wrong fucking occupation. <laughs> yeah. it's Maybe not- I should learn to do something different because this ain't working out for me. No, well. no, no. <laughs> That's a short. Right. Don Berlin says, old saying, healthy people attract healthy people and sick people attract sick, sick people. And so this is why the haters hang with the haters. No mystery here. He's right. You hate a fucking hate themselves. You know, you know Tommy. Um, Dr. Jordan Peterson says that you know, face ever since Facebook, uh, you know, it's like um, the the addiction to it and in YouTube too. For people, you know, it, it releases endorphins, but it also has brought on a lot of depression because people are getting negative feedback from people they don't even know. And so Joe Rogan's antidote to that is he's like, look. You got to treat oh, Facebook. Oh, great guy. Yeah, great. He goes, you got to treat Facebook like chocolate every once in a while. And that's it. You know what I mean? This way you don't drive yourself crazy. I, I say that, but I'm addicted. You can't expect, I mean, listen, If picture what Donald Trump went through. He's the president of the United States. From the time he ran to this day right now, the things people say about him, and you're talking hundreds of thousands of people. Millions. That, like, in you Google him like it would never end. The guy would take the rest of eternity to read all the negative shit people. There's good stuff about him. Right. But look at the things people accuse him of. I know. You know I say, but yet he kind of does take it on the chin. I don't know how he reacts at home. Right. But yeah. the public, he kind of expects it. You know what I'm trying to say? And you know yeah. what? Everything that that man said was going to happen. 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 Yeah. So. Whether you like them as an individual, a person or not, you know, um, everything that he, you know, everything he was doing for this country, everything he predicted that would happen if he lost the election, it happened. Gary, gas prices. Pre, I don't use premium, but it's 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 like a couple of cents away from six dollars a gallon yeah. down the block. I filled up today. It was it's five oh nine a gallon. At the beginning of COVID, came to Jersey, it was under two dollars a gallon. So what's happening here? Something's not right. There's no baby formula. We're in trouble. You know what we got to do? We got to get Michael Francis back in the gas business. Maybe he can help us out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> and you know what, Michael? I tell you, Michael Francis, hell of a guy. Yeah, he seems like he it. He seems really he really no, he, he really listen. I had conversations with him. Michael Francis is a really good guy, man. He seems it. He seems like a humble guy. Yeah. He was a he was a he, he was one of the most highest paid guys at one point, right? And he was millions and millions of dollars with that gas it was scam amazing. he had. Going. Yes. He was fucking genius, man. Oh, then you never even heard anybody just doing what he was doing. I mean, uh, and, and, and Sammy the Bull, I tell you, he's a funny guy. He's a ball buster. He's a ball buster. He's a, he's a, really is a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny with Sammy, though? Know? He'll, he he's not afraid to say what's on his mind either. You know what no. I'm saying? But he don't entertain he don't entertain any negativity because there's a lot of people hating on him too. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But you know what? Think of what he's been through. Yeah. He's been through a lot of shit in his life. What right, wrong, or indifferent? I'm not condoning anything. Not judge anybody. But Tommy. He's still here and he's still sitting in a chair smiling. You know. Smoking a cigarette with his cap on and his glasses, you know, and, he's still he's still doing all right for himself. And he looks great, like G- Joe Rogan. He did a little thing with him. Joe Rogan said he put him up on a picture. Look how handsome this guy is. He's still fucking handsome in his seventies. And Sammy and you both like that. He goes, I like this guy, Joe. He says I'm still handsome. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 listen, guys, I don't want to keep you any longer. We're in here for two hours now. Me and Tommy dates. 
to Stephen Gates. You know what? Listen, hey, I thank you so much for coming in. You're thank welcome. You. Listen, you're welcome here anytime. Thank you, brother. Okay? My email, my, yeah, my email is therealjimmycalandra at gmail.com. If you want to uh, do a show together, reach out to me. I would love to do a show with you. And Tommy Day's my big brother. You know, I love you. And thank you so much for coming in today. All right, Tommy, I love you, brother. I'll see love you. you too, Steve. All right. We got to go to Allen B and bring Philly with us. On me, on me. And we get Jim and me. Sounds good. Great. I see you guys. Thank you so much, guys. I love you thank, guys. Thank, thank you. Man, take care. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Well, guys, that was a great show. Tommy Dades, we had a little fun over here. Good discussion. Uh, Stephen Gates came in, another detective. Wow, it was really good. And uh, I had Joe Murray in the room. I had Phil Grimaldi in the room. All you people, let me give a couple shout outs over here Iron Man 718, Richard Wing. Princess Mish, thank you for coming. Mark Wachowski, Jimmy, Tommy, Stephen, thanks for a good night. Gary Montilione, Gary, thanks for coming in. I hope you're feeling better, and I hope you get some good results, okay? And, uh, you know, to everybody, live and let live, thank you so much. Boston J, my moderator, Mike the Printer. This motherfucker said, watch you, Jimmy. And uh, everybody that just came in and uh, enjoyed this show. I love you guys. I love everyone. Roro G, all of you. Listen, to my next video, I'll see you guys soon. Like I said, you know what? Listen, give your life to God. Do the right thing. And you know what? Always be kind to others, for sure. Listen, I'm changing my life every day. And, uh, you know, thank God I'm blessed. I have two beautiful kids that I love and adore. And I got great people around me. And every day, I'll make my crooked pass right. So with that said, I love you guys. Until my next video. And don't forget, this week, I'm going to have Frank Calabrese on. Operation Family Secrets. I tell us it's a hell of a story. And uh, he has a lot to say. This is a guy who testified against his father. But his father was a monster. His father killed a dozen people. I mean, you know what? His father could have took the pinch and said, you know what? Let this kid go. But, uh, you know, let's hear what uh, Frank Calabrese has to say this week. By Friday, he will be on. Okay, guys, I love you guys. Thanks for showing up, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye, guys. The streets will never make you grow. It's not a seed. It's a gutter. There's no happy endings in this life. So this is my message to you. never love you back.